Donations from viewers like you are actually what keep us going. And since public broadcasting might be down the shitter, we need your help now more than ever to get news from the front lines out to the people. To become a patron of ACT OUT, visit patreon.com slash ACT OUT. This week, the ills of racism are being kicked up anew, but this is an old fight. Former Black Panther and forever activist Kilu Niasha joins us to talk about the past, present, and the future of the fight on the front lines. And finally, Flint is a disgusting example of capitalist greed and injustice, but it's just one of many poor U.S. communities struggling under the weight of manifold malfeasance. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. A couple of weeks ago, Representative Steve King of Iowa took to Twitter to proudly proclaim his grotesque racism by jumping on the white genocide train in a tweet that read, We can't restore our civilization with somebody else's babies. When asked to clarify by a CNN talking head, King responded, I meant exactly what I said. Well, good. That's nice and clear then. To break that down real fast, this racist pile of fear, loathing, and psychosis is advocating for what Richard Spencer calls peaceful ethnic cleansing. The removal of anyone who doesn't look like Taylor Swift from the American gene pool, and thereby the restoration of a civilization that currently controls more power and wealth than any other group and has done so for hundreds of years through a grotesque and violent crusade of oppression and extraction, pushing other groups of people and animals to the brink of, if not into, extinction. This civilization has murdered somebody else's babies for centuries for no other reason than greed and white nationalistic narcissism. Meanwhile, the triumphs and accolades that this civilization can boast about have been won in no small part due to the work of somebody else's babies, either via forced work or work done against the odds set against them by this very civilization. Truly, the only thing one could hope to restore for this Western civilization, if indeed it ever had any, is some fucking dignity and respect for people and planet. In lieu of polishing that turd, however, the only recourse is to fight and build, as the thinly veiled rotting carcass of colonial capitalism, racist corporatism, and sexist commodification fractures and quakes, ignominiously breaking apart in a devilish swan song hell-bent on taking us all down with it. Comments like Steve King's are nothing new. Nor is the call for freedom, justice, peace, education, health care, the peace, land, and bread that Lenin shouted from the barricades that Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale echoed in their 10-point platform for the Black Panther Party. This face-off between the forces of oppression and the oppressed, evil and good, oligarch and citizen, we have been here before. And who knows, we may be here again after the fall, but much of that depends on what we do right now. In the ashes of the old, so often we end up building a structure in the image of what was just destroyed. Our human need for something comfortable, something uh, familiar, drives us to emulate the oppressive hierarchies, drives us to get stuck, wheels spinning in the potholes of history. We have to do better. We have to get uncomfortable in order to change. We must change and become ungovernable, for it is only by being ungovernable that we can effectively fight and build. It is only by releasing our ideological holds, and as Potoka put it, embracing the solidarity of the shaken, only by recognizing our shared instability, our shared oppression, can we actually be effective in creating something that works for all of us and the bits of planet that we have yet to fuck up beyond repair. 
We must be unapologetically uninformed and ready to use that information against the forces of oppression. We must turn the tools of oppression on itself, laying claim to these brains that they tried to whitewash, standing strong with these bodies that they tried to break or cage or otherwise whittle away through decades of work and a sick care system fed by our pain. We have to think and act. We have to fight and build. We, in the solidarity of the shaken side by side, on the front lines. As I mentioned briefly, the Black Panther Party utilized ideas from Lenin's call for peace, land, and bread in their 10-point party platform, written by founders Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale. In fact, both Newton and Seale spent considerable time and energy diving into the revolutions of the past, dissecting the movements and actions of the oppressed, picking apart and analyzing so as to be most effective in their fight for justice. Ultimately, however, as Newton writes in his autobiography, Revolutionary Suicide, quote, our unique situation required a unique program. Although the relationship between the oppressor and the oppressed is universal, forms of oppression vary. The party platform and the Black Panther Party itself went on to become a powerhouse of resolute activism and pointed fight and build efforts that directly engaged their communities and inspired people across the globe. The details of the rise and fall of the Black Panther Party and its leaders are something that everyone should research, but if nothing else, their approach of direct community activism and intellectual constructive resistance is something that we must consider as we work in our own communities today. Just as Newton wrote, we cannot directly apply the experiences of past revolutionaries to our current fight, but we can, and indeed we should, use their stories as tools with which to build. In that same vein, a few weeks ago, former Black Panther and forever activist Kilu Nyasha joined us to discuss the legacy of anti-racist, anti-fascist activism, the current climate, and the road ahead. Take a look. The election of Donald Trump, is that as terrifying as it sounds to some people, or is it just a more overt representation of what's already been there, the racism, the sexism, the bigotry that this country has embodied for a long time? Oh, yes, of course. I mean, we have, uh, what, 400 years of history of uh, uh, gross racism in this country, beginning with chattel slavery. Um, and when chattel slavery ended, uh, racism did not end, in fact, it uh, worsened in many respects because uh, we didn't have any protections. Um, the reconstruction period was terrible. We've been um, subjected to Jim Crow, to gross discrimination, to racism uh, in every aspect of our lives. And uh, so Trump is just, and, and, and the, uh, the eight years of Obama uh, so pacified black people and white liberals that uh, we laid down and, and let, let him do all the dirt that he did. So uh, Obama paved the way for Trump. And the other thing that paved the way for Trump was the fact that we, and when I say we, the American people have been going for this reactionary duopoly for good, how long? I mean, hundreds of years now. And uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, they are nothing but uh, a one-party state with a, a right wing and a left wing. And uh, actually, I think it's the right and the far right. Right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. And, and I, I in that same vein, um, you, you're talking about o Obama sort of pacifying uh, white liberals and, and black communities as well. I'm interested to hear your hear your perspective on this, the, the, the sort of use of black bodies in our culture, whether that be what Cornell West called Obama the sort of black poster child for Wall Street, or on the flip side, you have this, uh, this perpetuating stereotype of of black men and women inside these very strict confines of what those of, of what that means to be a black man or a black woman, talk about the 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 continuous use of black bodies in in the American cultural paradigm. Well, they've been using uh, black people as 
uh, front men for their, to do their dirt for them for a long, long time. And of course, um, I mean, you just take a look at uh, Ben Carson right now. What is he but a token Negro for Trump to display to somehow in, uh, suggest to people that he's not racist, which is silly. But um, we, uh, Obama we ha was groomed for the presidency, and I think they were very clever. He, he was always relatively conservative. In fact, when he made his big speech about racism, I remember distinctly his saying uh, uh, some of the things that came out of his grandmother, who was mostly raised in his grandmother's mouth, made him cringe. OK, so he, he grew up knowing well white supremacist racism. And I think he's a white supremacist himself. Black people, a lot of people don't think black people can be white supremacists. But if you think that white people are superior and that somehow or another you're the exceptional Negro, then you are a white supremacist, okay? So we have to be clear on that. That uh, And one of the, uh, the, I couldn't argue, I had so much trouble with white liberals because they, they take the idea that just because somebody's black, somehow or another they're gonna be better. Well, that's silly too. So I think that we all have, have to deal with racism. And with the Trump administration, I think it's it's great that he's as blatant as he is. I think it's great that they've got all these arch racists, you know, these no ifs, ands, or buts about it racists in the White House. Because now, I mean, look what's going on. People are waking up, people are taking are learning all about government, they're learning about they're giving civics lessons every day, you know, I mean, they're organizing, they're protesting, you know, and I think it's wonderful. So in that same vein, I remember that uh, you, you wrote on your blog about the election and how you don't think that voting is the is the right path forward. And, and that sort of speaks to your comment about that's not really the right wing and the left wing, it's the right wing and the further right wing. Uh, what would, yeah. what do you, what do you say to to people who want to get engaged and, and have always thought that voting would fix things, uh, what are the next steps? Um, and in, in that same vein, your experience uh, in in the Black Panther movement and the movement for, uh, for equality, this idea of not just fighting something, but building an alternative at the same time. Exactly. Well, I just have to go back to the Black Panther Party. Um, we were a revolutionary political party our ideology was Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, okay? Now, I think that over time, we would have maybe adjusted some of those uh, ide ideological premises uh, because of changing conditions. And I think some of our tactics and strategies would have to be changed. Uh, the bottom line is, um, I don't uh, recommend going up against uh, this uh, government militarily. However, we have power because they're, they're a fraction, the ruling class in this country now is a fraction of 1%. We've got three, eight people who own half the world's wealth. Eight, okay? So the wealth is concentrated in a tiny percentage of the global population, a tiny percentage of the American population, and we are the 99%, for goodness sakes. What do we have to do? We have to unite. How can we unite if we can't get along with each other. If we, if we judge every person by the color of his or her skin, we cannot. We, we have to unite to, to move on this government. And no, I don't believe in voting because what are you voting for? We've been, I think that's, that's why we have this hor horrific government in place now is because we've been vo voting for the lesser of two evils for hundreds of years. And what are we voting for? We're voting for evil. How can it be lesser? It's evil. And in that in that same vein, your thoughts, because I know that there's there's always the discussion of the, this diversity of tactics, and of course the Black Panthers had a diversity of tactics as well. What what are your thoughts on 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 like what tactics should we be using? Are there certain ones that we should be focusing more on, like the march versus the blockade, nonviolence versus destructive tactics? Um, and uh, and it, and also a little bit more about the the self defense against an increasingly violent system. Good questions, all. And um, I did want to backpedal a little. I don't think I answered your earlier question too well um, about 
I think we need a revolutionary party. The Black Panther Party was a revolutionary party, but it was limited to black. We need an international revolutionary party, okay? And uh, that will fight for the socialist revolution that Bernie Sanders, Sanders uh, uh, alluded to in his campaign, but didn't stick with it. So we really do need a, a, a revolutionary political party uh, that advocates for a redistribution of the wealth and uh, advocates for all the things that we uh, demanded in our 10-point platform and program, uh, decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings, okay? The housing prices is horrible right now. And uh, we need uh, healthy food. We need uh, uh, child care, on-site on child care, free child care, free education all the way through the university. There's no reason we can't have those things if the wealth of this country is distributed appropriately. First, we can vote with our dollars, and I've been doing that for years. There's so many, many department stores and companies and corporations I won't do any business with, even though I don't have diddly squat. <laughs> I... I, I, that's on principle. So we, if we all took up, became principled in what we do with our money, okay, that's number one. And I've noticed that a lot of people are already doing that, okay, and that's a good thing. Then the second thing is that uh, it, it's in keeping with that, which is boycott. We have the power of boycott. We should boycott, divest um, for, and in, in terms of the Palestinian situation. We should not be supporting Zionist Israel's repression of, and occupation of Palestine. So that's uh, one of the things that we can do. The other things that uh, the things that we can do besides, you know, protest and all, speak out. Stop being liberal. When I mean liberal, just being quiet and silent and letting things slide for the sake of peace and free friendship. No, speak up. When you hear wrong ideas. Speak up if you're at a party, a dinner party, uh, at work, anybody, people start talking politics, speak up. Don't allow uh, reactionary untruths um, go down without you're saying something. Your silence is approval, okay? So that's what I think. And every strategy that you can think of, and you, young people are the ones who are going to come up with some some creative stuff, you know. We oldies, we, we're not as creative and as bold and as audacious as the youth are. So it's really, we can give you some guidance. We can help you uh, not fall in the pits that we fell into, you know, or fall in the pit and the gain and the wit. So listen to your elders, because we've, we've, we've accumulated a little wisdom behind all the mistakes that we made. And we can help you avoid those same mistakes, those same pitfalls. However, we depend on you for the creative um, uh, movement that is absolutely necessary today. And we know that you can come up with some creative ideas. And tech savvy people can do all kinds of things on the internet. And uh, you know, and me, I'm just going to keep on um, educating to liberate till I die. You know, I'm just going to keep studying and learning and trying to grow and trying to be less racist and less uh, uh, selfish and more considerate and more sharing and giving and kinder and all that, but very militant in, 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 uh, in uh, striving to uh, end fascism and institute a people's government. The Black Panther Party's 10-point platform is still a pointed reference for today's fights, not least of all in terms of access to decent housing, education, food, justice, and peace. The Black Lives Matter movement alone serves as a shocking reminder that we are far from acknowledging that black lives actually do matter. From the streets to the schools to the courts and back round again. And while all of us, regardless of race, or class or gender, find ourselves in the crosshairs of a corporatocratic empire in decline, one need only look at places like Flint, Michigan, to see that poor, oftentimes minority communities are first to be forgotten, first to be sacrificed, and last to receive aid, if indeed it ever comes. And while Flint, Michigan rolls into its third year without clean water or any real solution in sight, it is but one of many poor communities struggling under the oppressive malfeasance of the capitalist lowlife scum at the top. You lowlife scum. 
A Reuters report from two weeks ago shows that dozens of communities in California have rates of childhood lead poisoning that even surpass those found in Flint. One of the more egregious examples, Fresno, where 13.6% of blood tests on children under six years of age showed high levels of lead, compared to just 5% in Flint. Fresno, as it happens, was also ranked number seven on a list of America's 11 poorest cities in 2015. Or take St. Joseph, Missouri as another example. In this historic and seemingly quaint town that borders Kansas in the northwestern part of the state, 26% of residents live below the poverty line, compared to around 19% in the state as a whole and roughly 14.5% nationwide. According to information pulled by that in-depth Reuters investigation last year, in St. Joseph, up to 23% of children tested showed elevated levels of lead. Again, compare this to 5% in Flint. In Canton, Ohio, where the poverty level is a staggering 40%, over 50% of children tested in one area showed elevated lead levels. The average for the area is well, below, well above 40 percent and in fact doesn't dip below 30 anywhere in the vicinity of this former heavy manufacturing center. A little further northwest, there's Cleveland, a city that ranked ninth in a 2016 Brookings analysis of 100 U.S. cities with the highest concentration of poverty. Here's what Reuters found. All those black spots? Those indicate that 40 percent or more of those tested showed elevated levels. The darkest pink denotes between 35 and 40 percent. Moving east, let's look at Philly. The DNC was just there. The sun bounced off of black limos, and a posh center city seemed to speak of a city well-off and booming. But that's not the case. Just last year, a couple of months before the DNC, a report came out showing that among the U.S.'s 10 largest cities, Philadelphia had the highest deep poverty rate. And here again, we see several instances of 40% or more of test subjects exhibiting elevated levels of lead. Indeed, if you zoom out, you'll find that Pennsylvania and surrounding areas are just littered with high levels of lead in test subjects, who again were all children. And again, there's no amount of lead that's safe. But these kids had levels of lead in their blood that are above the level of concern, which according to the CDC is five micrograms per deciliter or higher. The CDC also points out that any instance showing elevated levels, not to mention more than 50% of a test population, requires a public health response. As any elevated levels can reduce IQ and stunt development, both mentally and physically. Now you'll notice that there are spots on the Reuters test map that are empty. As pointed out in their report, the available data includes 21 states, home to around 61% of the US population. Health departments in some states didn't possess the data or respond to records request. Others wouldn't share it, saying they weren't required to or citing patient privacy laws. Privacy over public health. I mean, unless you're we the people, then fuck your privacy, as evidenced by the largest surveillance network in the history of humanity, bolstered last week by the move in Congress to sell your private information to companies looking to, uh, you know, rummage around a bit. But yeah, have some lead with your spying eyes, be it in water, lead-based paint, or even in the air you breathe, it's quite clear that there is a grotesque lead poisoning problem in this country, despite the fact that officials claim a job well done due to lead regulations passed in previous decades. The problem is that regulation really means fuck all if it isn't backed by action. So the CDC says there's a public health emergency in roughly 3,000 areas across the U.S., as per that Reuters report. So what? It's kind of like the UN saying that the situation in Gaza is evidence of human rights violations by the Israeli state. Yeah, no shit. But without action, it's just a label. And in communities labeled toxics that are also labeled poor, it's unlikely that they'll see any government action on their behalf. A study by Scientific American in late 2012 showed that poor minority neighborhoods are more likely to be exposed to higher levels of air pollution than their white affluent counterparts. And of course, the rich and white tend to live further away from industries and their toxic runoff. It's actually pretty unusual that you get a case where, for instance, I don't know, uh, an ExxonMobil CEO joins a lawsuit against fracking in his backyard, although that did happen. 
You might have heard of him, Rex Tillerson, the, the Secretary of State, the oozing pus boil in a human flesh suit that couldn't give a rat's ass about public health until him and his family are considered part of the public. And so it follows that because our government is made up of millionaires and billionaires, the consideration for public health outside the confines of the country club is limited at best. Remarking on a 2016 NRDC study that found that more than 18 million Americans drink from lead-laden water, NRDC President Rhea Sue said, the bottom line is that the lead is found in drinking water in cities well beyond Flint, often affecting vulnerable lower-income communities of color. Unsafe drinking water is a national problem that needs a national solution. The report goes on to outline how 18 million is really kind of a conservative estimate due to rigged testing of water supplies and lax, if not wholly non-existent, enforcement. Sounds a lot like what investigators with Reuters noticed in their attempts to test the country's children for lead. Using privacy as a, an excuse to keep public health records from uh, the, the public? Rigging the tests so you won't have to deal with the shitty enforcement that might not even be in place. This isn't an expired license we're fucking talking about. This is mass poisoning of children, of adults too. This is a national fucking emergency. Flint has gone almost three years without clean drinking water. How long have these other areas been shoving toxins into their kids, their adults, the land and the animals? And how much longer will it be before the millions drinking their own demise perish under the weight of capitalist malfeasance? How sick do we have to get before health becomes a priority? Of course, the problem is, if we're asking that question, we already have the answer. As I mentioned in my talk here in Australia at Zeitgeist Fest this past week, either capitalism will kill us or we will kill capitalism. There is no third trajectory for a system built on endless extraction and thereby oppression. There will never be a convenient time to stand up and fight. Uncomfortable must become our new comfort zone. And ungovernable must be our new citizenship. For the sake of we, the people, against the low-life scum. You low-life scum. And that'll do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. For those interested in working on environmental and or public health issues locally, look for just that local groups that are working on local projects. The national orgs and issues can often become bland with broad strokes and lose the pointed fight that made groups like the Black Panthers, for example, so effective and so dangerous to the establishment. And as you go out to rattle some thrones, please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. As always, be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. From Sydney, Australia, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to act out, visit Patreon.com slash act out.